Okay, my my clock says that it's time to start, so maybe we can start now. Um, thank you for coming, especially after lunch, or maybe you came for just to to sleep. That's that's also a possibility. Um, I will try to explain uh, because Brian in the first uh, session just before the the lunch explained how we were accepting Fedora CI jobs in uh, the CentOS system ecosystem. So I will try to give you a little bit of uh, information about what happened behind the scene, but also uh, how the CentOS infra runs, uh, what we share already as tool with uh, Cent uh, with Fedora, and um, the future. So the first thing is the mandatory slide for who am I? Uh, if people n don't know me yet, uh, my name is Fabien Rotin. I'm a Belgian guy. I work in the CentOS project. I think I joined officially in 2007, and I'm in the Season in Infra team, uh, also a QA team, and a CentOS board member. Um, so we'll cover some of those things like. I will give you a little bit of history about CentOS because it can explain from where we are coming, especially from the infra side. That will give you an overview, and then we can dive into how we will uh, we are slowly changing things in the process. So, what's different and what's coming with uh, the Fedora infra uh, those days and the future? So. It started a long time ago. Who remembers when Red Hat decided to split between um, Red Enterprise and Fedora? Raise the hand. Three guys only. OK. So um, it started a long time ago. And that's how it started on our side. Um, we embraced that um, um, myself. I was happy to test it was Fedora Core 099, if I remember well. The, the one that was supposed to be to, to be Red Hat Linux 10. And uh, we were just happy with that. Uh, except that for our own system, uh, at the infra level, we decided to uh, have something that was really interesting to rebuild, just for academic purposes only. Nobody would have expected in those days that uh, the CentOS project would be so used by other people all around the world. So um, it started from... Um, a project called Chaos Linux, which doesn't exist anymore those days. The goal was m for Chaos project itself was just to uh, build a new distribution based on existing technology like RPM, mostly. Um, sub project of Chaos Linux was interested in rebuilding Red Hat Enterprise Linux source just to, for academic purposes, see how it was possible to do it, to rebuild on itself a distribution. And uh, it was just for fun. Believe me, it was just for fun. So it started uh, basically uh, from people having one machine in the basement or in the garage doing nothing, spare time. And that was used to, to recompile package, mostly. So we started from zero infra at all. Nothing. But then we had some um, publicity, advertising, I don't know how to call that, from Stephen Genicals, who did a comparison the rebuild of Red Hat Enterprise Linux at that time. So there was Tau Linux, if some people remi remember. Uh, Scientific Linux started to become a thing. Uh, we were there, and the first one was White Box Linux, which myself I was also using at the time. We started with that, and suddenly some people were, hey, that's great, we are starting to use your package and your distribution. So what do you need? Well, at the moment, we have nothing. So just one public machine with uh, public uh, presence, like a website or forums, would help. Here we go. Uh, do you want to use the same machine as a first mirror? Of course we, we want. Nobody refused a machine connected at 100 megabit connection in those days. So we started slowly, and we got one, two, three, four, five machines. Um, officially, it, it really kicked out in 2007 when we had the first official presence uh, for the project at um, at FOSDEM in 2007. And uh, we had a lot of, we started, believe, it, believe uh, that or not, but we started discussion with, uh, discussing with the Fedora people because we were sharing the same distro dev room in that um, uh, FOSDEM event. So we started really from scratch, but we needed uh, to automate as much as possible, really. Because we were all uh, having different jobs. 
and we didn't want to spend too much time on the center's infra itself. So that's where we started to invest time into things called Puppet, which we use since version 0 dot something. I myself, I remember having migrated from 0 to 23 to then 3.4, 2.5, 2.6, etc., up to 3.8. Um, yeah, before Git, there was also uh, another thing called Subversion, which we use a lot those days to put everything under control. And before the cloud was a thing, we had already the puts versus cattle syndrome. Because all the machines that were donated to us, we had no guarantee that the machine would be there the next day or two weeks after. So we had to consider the machine, it's great, the machine is there. The machine disappears, we don't care. So we had to automate as much as possible from day one. The reason why machines disappear, well, yeah, there are plenty of reasons. First one, which is logical, is because of an hardware failure. So we had we had a lot of machines in those days wh which were just single machine with just single drive, SATA drive, dying and machine die on us. So I would consider that normal for a machine to disappear. The monitoring system pop ups and said, "Oh, machine is not there. We have contact and." Okay, we get a, uh, sometimes a replacement. What is really more interesting is the next case where we get contact with a company who decide to say, hey, we want to sponsor you, a machine or two, but the machine runs. You don't notify the fact that that company was acquired by another company. And sometimes that second company was even acquired by another one, a third one company. And the third one say, oh, we don't care about open source. We don't have any special program for open source. And that machine is abusing a little bit too much of the bandwidth because it's successful. So the machine, sometimes we, if we are lucky, they contact us back to say, hey, we, don't, we want to stop helping you. But most of, the, well, most of the time, the machine just disappears without notification at all. Um, or the company goes bankrupt completely. And the only way to know is that you use Google, you find some press release, the fact that your company just go bankrupt and went, went bankrupt and you just discovered. So I, I don't think that I have a bullet point for, for the another case, interesting case, is that sometimes we just proactively contact them just to see the, if they are still alive. I do that on a regular basis to just reach out. And sometimes they do. Their answer, yeah, we are still happy. If you want a new node, a better node replacement, that's better. And sometimes I have some kind of answer like, what? No, we don't run any machine for you. Yes, you do. Here's the IP. Yes, it's in our subnet, but no, we don't. And then I'm scared because I'm just wondering what kind of inventory they use. Um, and we, we, I, I had the, 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 that issue two weeks ago. I had uh, one of the disks dying in the machine. I tried to contact and say, no. I said, the machine is still running. No, no, no. So, yeah, it happens to, uh, to us a lot. That's one of the big difference, maybe, with the Fedora Infra, is that we just run from community donated machine. Uh, the C in CentOS means community, not in the sense that we have a lot of developer contributing uh, back in those days, but mostly company sponsoring machine bandwidth because we need it. So we started with um, a kind of trust relationship with those donor, because you don't want to run something crucial, sensitive. Uh, if just someone from Russia say, "Oh, I just want to rent to give you a machine," so we just start uh, by using those with something that is non-crucial, like uh, a mirror machine, because on the mirror itself everything is GP design checked, control. Uh, and the first thing we do is we don't want to spend too much time doing an audit on the machine itself, so we just reinstall it from scratch automatically. Um, that's how we start with those donated machines. And something that we, we have a kind of automated process for that is we try to, as I said, to reach out to see if their support mechanism works fine or not. And based on the experience, you know if that machine can be used for something else or just stay at it as it is as a a member of the cattle. And depending on response time and um, 
the experience we have with those guys, um, we just slowly move more critical roles like um, NS records because it's still running from donated machine even those days. So the infra was growing up, but we had more or less the same issue as in Fedora, um, except maybe that um, surprising, we had at the, those, those days we have even have more external mirror than what Fedora has. So we have at the moment more than 600 external mirror fetching everything from us for the package, the update, the ISO image. So it's quite successful, I would say, because on our side, even with the number of machines we got from community, it's not possible to sustain um, the, the number of requests. Um, and we had to, well, for example, just to feed, uh, to send those packages to those 600 external mirror, we have what we call the M-Sync role, which is mirror and R-Sync. Uh, using access control is to just let those external mirror fetch from us. Uh, so sorry if you don't, you, you are not able to fetch directly from us, but we have to protect the bandwidth because some machine in those 67 uh, machines are connected at very slow speed. Um, I have some machine in mind in some part of the, the world, like in Malaysia, for example, we have machine connected at 10 megabit per second to us. It's international level. So wait a minute, we are in 2018, 10 megabit per second? Yes, but keep in mind that bandwidth costs a lot in those area, and they have international, internal, uh, international connection that is really limited. But in locally in the country, that's 100 megabit or gigabit connectivity. So even if it takes time just for us to see that machine there, suddenly it's really fast for the other people and other mirror in the same country to, to, to get content. So it saves bandwidth on our side as well. So uh, it's a win-win situation. We had quickly to implement something that exists also at the federal side. We do GeoIP, um, of course, for YAM, for the mirror lists. So you are redirected to machines that are validated in your own country or nearby country if there is no mirror in your country. But we do that also at the DNS uh, for records like mirror.centers.org. Um, you are redirected to the machine that is closest to you. So what's different from uh, the Fedora Infra? Um, some of the application that we still run for the, the users, like as I said, the mirror management at the moment is still different. So it started from custom scripts, Perl initially, <laughs> slowly converted to Python those days, versus mirror manager. There's some discussion about switching to mirror manager or not. In the past, that was not possible at all because we had no authentication system that was required for that. Now that we have fast, I will cover that later, different instance of FAST, our own version, that would be eventually possible. But we have a discussion with Adrian, by the way, uh, just to, to eventually move to that. The bug tracker will probably just remain different. We had in the past to, to, to select one of the open source solution. Bugzilla was not on the shortlist <laughs> back in the days. So we are still uh, upgrading from uh, Mantis bug tracker version to, to the latest version. Uh, so we still ha we are still autonomous. It can be problematic from time to time because we just have to link to upstream bug in bugzilla.redat.com, and so users have to fill on our side a bug, and then we have to link to an external bug report. So it can be tricky from time to time, but there is no solution for that right now. Uh, for the wiki, um, uh, if you use Fedora for quite some time, you are probably um, uh, you know that it was used uh, for Fedora, it was Moin, uh, which was migrated to MediaWiki. We are still running Moin those days. There, on that uh, aspect, we are also investigating two things, either just migrating, continue migrating to from Moin version to the other, or switch to MediaWiki for a simple reason, uh, because we know that it, it works for Fedora, it's the OpenID authentication uh, that can work on our side. So that's one of the open points. Um, a big difference is probably the message bus. For Fedora, there is a huge, huge, huge message bus. The Fedora message bus, the Fed message bus, is really used for um, almost everything. It's really verbose, maybe very, a little bit too verbose sometimes. Um, on our side, we 
had no requirement to have that kind of bus in place. Uh, for the infra part, we just built a small one, but was based on MQTT, which I liked a lot. I used that for other projects uh, because it's lightweight. Uh, it supports TLS of the box. It supports access control list of the box. So we have that in place for some part of the infra right now. Um, I will explain one specific case, for example, later. And um, infra monitoring is also done differently. Uh, Fedora still use Nagios. Uh, Nagios. Uh, on our side, we decided to use Zabbix a long time ago, uh, mostly because the, the CentOS team infra team was really small. It still is small. So basically, at the moment, it's just Brian and me. <laughs> but uh, when we started to investigate about uh, monitoring, Zabbix had some really cool feature that we wanted to have built in uh, that Na Nagios was lacking those days. For example, the fact that out of the box it has central DB to log everything, all the metrics that you collect. So we, we have all data there because we migrated from Zabbix version to Zabbix version um, for more than 10 years and we had no problem with that. Another concept that is interesting is the fact that you have proxies. Um, if you remember the fact that all the machines from CentOS are spread all around the world, you can delegate uh, the tasking that everything works fine just to collect the metrics to proxies. So, for example, you don't want a node in the USA to just eat all the machine, for example, in Australia or uh, um, Asia, just to check that everything's fine. You just delegate those tasks to a kind of proxy, which report everything back into the central server. Uh, it has also an API, which we can use a lot to automate plenty of things. Um, so there are some tools available ri uh, written in Python called Zabbix CLI, or if you are using Ansible, uh, there are now modules just to for that, just to configure um, uh, templates, for example, tied to a machine. So one example is I mentioned um, I mentioned Puppet, which at the moment we are still running. Um, we migrated from Puppet version to Puppet version, and we decided to m use Foreman. I'm pretty sure that everybody knows Foreman. We use Foreman as a, form, uh, as a Puppet external node classifier. So Puppet, um, everything from Puppet is uh, in the Foreman database. So who in the room has already played with form Puppet or is still using Puppet? One guy, two guys, I know you are lying, I know. So one of the main points on my side uh, with Puppet is that it's great for desired state. So you declare the desired state for the machine and you apply that locally. But what about the fact that the monitoring has to know everything about the other node? Puppet by default had no solution back in the days. So the only way to do that is to export all the thing back into another DB called Puppet DB and then for the monitoring server role it just consumes everything that it fetched from the, the Puppet DB so knowing all the facts from all the machine and verify that it still applies. So if you multiply if you multiply that by the number of nodes you have sometimes Puppet catalog um, apply that that takes more than 30 minutes just to verify that nothing changed and it's still good. So as it was a little bit consuming, I said, well, it's a little bit strange to have everything in Foreman being applied to the machine, reported back into another DB, and then applied by the, the monitoring server. So I decided to use some kind of uh, shortcut with Foreman hooks. Foreman hooks is really interesting because it's triggered. So when you had a node, when you modify a node, when you delete a node, it triggers an, uh, something at the back with the Foreman hooks. And that's where uh, I was mentioning MQTT, for example. At the moment when, for example, we had a machine, or we just tag, we just add some Puppet modules and some Puppet roles on the machines, it will automatically notify uh, the, the, the Zabbix server through uh, MQTT on a specific topic. And at the other side, it just read, it just uh, subscribe to that topic and verify, oh, I'm just now a mirror machine or I'm a DNS or whatever, I will automatically apply the template and the check directly. So that I it doesn't need to consume a lot, a lot of resource. Um, so that's one of the that's one of the reasons why we just decide to to use that. So what's common those days with Federal Infra tool? 
Well, uh, it's not a secret that we use Koji. Uh, Brian mentioned that. Um, it's not the Fedora instances, it's our own instances uh, on CBS for Community Build System, uh, .centers .org. But if you are working and if you are contributing to Fedora and CentOS at the same time, you are feeling like, oh, because you know the tool already, it's there, you know how to use it, um, and nothing changed. Same thing when we decided finally to um, use the same authentication system that Fedora was using, FAS. Except once again that it's not federated uh, uh, at the moment, so it's still using its own uh, FAS database, uh, which is accounts.center.org. Um, and we still use that heavily because we try to plumb more and more things um, on the FAST system that we have. Um, because not everything can talk to FAST directly, we need something in between, exactly the same requirement as for Fedora, so nothing secret here. Epsilon. So we also use Epsilon just to provide a way to get through FAST through OpenID, Looking or OpenID Connect. Um, and that permits us to have multiple no application uh, using our authentication backend. So, other common tools, if we consider that both projects have the same requirement, more or less, let's say 80 to 90 percent of the, um, the problem to solve are the same, we are slowly um, migrating to the same tooling, the same tool chain for infra. One big change that is come well big that was a long time coming but is uh, uh, finally happening is migrating to Ansible from Puppet uh, for various reasons because we had already a lot a lot a lot of Ansible playbooks to that we were using in the uh, CentOS Infra for deployment for uh, ad hoc task orchestration etc that Puppet was not able to do that natively and M Collective was something I was not keen on using so. Uh, we are using a lot Ansible for the CI environment. Everything in CI, in that environment, I will cover that later, is just um, deployed through Ansible, end to end. So we'll migrate to Ansible soon, and the fact that we'll migrate to Ansible soon, if you're interested in contributing to the infra, or just have a look at that, we'll just have some Git repository where we'll just slowly publish everything, all the roles that we are slowly um, converting from Puppet to, uh, to Ansible. So the, the, the big change that is coming and that was probably announced if you were in the other room yesterday was uh, the Git merge thing. I have to say thank you to Jim to have thrown me out on the bus. <laughs> so now that I have to mention it. So it's migrating to Pagur. Uh, or Pagur, if I want to say the correct, if, but Pierre is not in the room. So um, that's, that one, that change is coming. We'll have to do a lot of messaging around that because it will change the way people are building through Koji. Uh, but at the same time, it will just make more sense if you are already contributing to Fedora because suddenly, oh, I know it. I know what to expect from it. Um, it's not migrating to Pagger only. What was announced yesterday was that slowly we'll have also some replication between the Fedora instance and our instance. So when you um, when you will push to a branch that you have access to for uh, the Fedora side, it will be replicated and visible on git.center.org in the Fedora branch. Reverse is true. If something is pushed on our side, it will be uh, pushed to the other side and visible for everybody. One small remark for that was not um, uh, that was not said yesterday. That's just for the Git repository the lookaside cache content will not be synced at least uh, in the beginning because it has some different um, directory structures so something we can consider later uh, another tool which is coming um, is documentation and will re reuse what was announced recently for uh, Fedora uh, for docs.fedora.project.org um, so uh, we'll use also the same tool same tool chain no need to reinvent the wheel each time. Uh, it's better to collaborate and reuse. Um, and that's what we'll do. So 
a little bit remark uh, some remarks about the CentOS CI environment. So Brian give it, uh, give a talk about the process on how package were tested. Um, it in the CI environment it targets mostly apps.ci, so which is the OpenShift setup. But we have more than that. So yeah, we had some happy donor and sponsored, and Red Hat is the biggest one those days since we joined. So thanks to them, uh, we have some bare metal nodes available for testing. So outside of the machine that Bren uh, was mentioning, OpenShift setup, we have at the moment 256 machines which are in the ready pool just to be used, hub used, for uh, reinstall and test. I will cover that just after. We have also um, audio based OpenStack Cloud setup in place so that if you um, don't need a bare metal machine but can be run in a, in, um, uh, in a virtual machine, we can just abuse that cloud environment for that. I will cover that later as well. And yeah, OpenShift because Brian mentioned it already. So we try to eat our own dog food. All the components that we are using there are also built and tested through CBS and test it in CI, and then we use them as a kind of a matroshka thing, just to you test what you produce on top of what you built already. So, and it works pretty well so far. So for the bare metal node, as I said, it's just Ansible deployment, nothing fancy. It's really simple task that just talk to the hardware, provision the machine, reinstall the machine, have kickstart that are just basic Jinja 2 templates, and depending on what we need, because at the moment we cover CentOS 6, CentOS 7, um, it just reinstalls the machine, it's covered now, uh, it covers also uh, PowerPC 64 LE, so Pickle, Power Pickle, uh, as <laughs> Peter would say, um, and yeah, nothing really uh, fancy, but it works quite really well. On top of that, we just have our own uh, application written uh, and maintained by Brian, uh, which is called Duffy, which is a kind of abstraction layer for the CI project. So when they want to get one, two, three nodes, so multi-node setup for one job is possible at the moment. For bare metal, you request, for example, up to, I think the limit is uh, six nodes, six nodes per call. So you want six nodes in one shot, in one second later, you get six machines available for you automatically with your SSH key um, uh, provision inside. Um, that's what we more detail on the wiki page if you want, and also there is a link on the on the Git, uh, on GitHub for the source of that if you are interested. So quite simple uh, for the OpenStack setup. Um, I would say that it's simple as well, but usually not today. It seems some people say, "Hey, are you crazy?" OpenStack, you use OpenStack and easy in the same sentence, something must be wrong with you. And probably yes. But we decide to keep it really simple. So the current status is that uh, we had a previous one based on Newton release and now it's running Pike. Um, the deployment of the controller and all, all the compute nodes in that setup is also Ansible driven completely. The the machine, the machine deployment at the bare metal is done through Ansible, and then everything else is done through Ansible as well. So adding machine into the OpenStack cloud setup, um, everything is automated. Um, one big difference is that we don't consume the cloud the usual way people would consume the cloud. The in the CI environment, all the projects that want to run the test are not tenant. So because, as I said, we are using Duffy as a kind of abstraction layer to uh, to let people consume a resource, that's the same. Res that's the same thing for um, the the cloud instance. You ask a cloud instance uh, through Duffy. Duffy itself is a tenant and can consume a lot of resource from that cloud transparently. And then when the machine, uh, when you don't need the machine, the machine is just kicked out. Uh, that's the difference with bare metal when the b the machine is just automatically reinstalled with the kickstart. Um, I just had to look at the number, by the way, for the reinstall of the machine at the bare metal setup this morning. We had more than five, 570,000 physical reinstallation in CI.centered.org. So I think that's quite impressive, and even if that's the, k the KISS principle. Uh, we try to use the same principle, especially because we are a lazy guy and we have to maintain that. Um, we try to, when you have a look at the OpenStack setup, 
uh, the traditional Diago, a lot, a lot of components because OpenStack is nothing more, a lot of services talking to API of each other components. But you don't need specifically all the components. We wanted to give something really fi uh, really simple to manage. Uh, we just wanted to go with a flat network for a specific reason. We don't control the switches anyway. So we had to keep things simple just by using the, for the Neutron config, just using layer two in bridge mode so that the virtual machine are in the same network as the bare metal machine for testing. Everything in the same pool. Um, and as I said, we try to, to be as uh, minimal as possible, meaning that we just needed Keystone, of course, because that's a cornerstone for, key for, for OpenStack, Glance for the image store, uh, Neutron for network, and Nova for the compute node, so hypervisor role, nothing more. We don't even need Horizon, the web UI, because it's just API. At the moment, it's just Duffy API talking to OpenStack API, nothing more. So um, it's not a secret that we started collaborating with the Federal Infra team because we were facing the same issue, um, but it's happening more and more. And I'd like myself to th to say thank you to some people like Patrick, because Patrick was really helpful for some of the um, implementation, uh, like for FAS, uh, for um, for Ypsilon, and recently for uh, Thicture Boot. So thank you, Patrick. Um, same goes for Pierre, which is uh, who is not there today, but he was really helpful for the Pagular integ um, integration. Um, some feature they will see coming in Pagular are because we requested for that. Uh, we thought that it would be interesting. And uh, Smooch, which is uh, not there, but yeah. Anyway, that's even easier just to say thank you to the World Federal Infra team. Um, that will be easier for me. And more collaboration um, later. I think that's it for me on my side. So if you have question, we have time and a microphone. No question. That's easier for me. Oh, one question. We can use the microphone so that I don't have to repeat your question. It's supposed to be working at the back. At the it should be powered on. <laughs> and now it works. Collaboration. Perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, how uh, you? Or how do you decide um, this kind of account management we use? For example, there are alternatives like free IPA. Uh, how you do uh, such decisions? And um, about the switch from from Puppet to Ansible. Um, uh, are you still using Foreman or are you using something like Tower? So two questions. The first is about um, authentication. So initially, back in the days, we decided to, 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 uh, to use something central, centralized because it's, it was a problem when the forums were using their own authentication backend. And then another system, another system in the wiki and the, the bug tracker. So we were going to need to have central authentication. We had a look at what was available. And we also had, uh, had a look at what Fedora was using because um, one of the, 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 the requirement was community portal. So community self-registration, people could self-register for an account and then be promoted. If you have a look at IPA, IPA is really looking at enterprise thing, but there was lacking that kind of self-portal. Nobody can self-register in IPA, except if you write something on top. Which but um, those days it was more like um, it was just for Kerberos authentication and the, f the way we deployed Koji initially for the build system we were using X509 so TLS certificate authentication uh, which FAS was doing so FAS was a, a meeting requirement but if you are contributed to Fedora you know that uh, things are slowly changing at the Fedora side because there is already Kerberos now behind the scene it's because of fast is talking to IPA database backend 
So that's something that we'll probably just need to, to spend time on to catch up, but our, uh, be at the same level as the Fedora, Fedora guys um, to decide to, to finally migrate to IPA database for multi master replication, etc. So that was for a question. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? Okay. The second one was about uh, migrating from um, your puppet informant to Sensible. That question is, mm, I would say, maybe still open in the sense that I, while I liked Foreman a lot, for Puppet it made sense because it was his target, it was the primary target. So deployment and Puppet, uh, Puppet dashboard. But the way you can integrate Ansible with with Puppet, uh, with uh, Foreman those days is really limited. You can't uh, run ad hoc task. It's just you can just tag role, nothing more, not even playbox using role or specific orchestration. So it doesn't fit. Um, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't work for us. So we had a look at Tower. Well, at not at Tower, but AWX. And AWX, at the moment, I was surprised that it's lacking some of the feature we want. Like, um, uh, well, on the uh, at the authentication level, it should be possible to use SAML token now, though so going through Epsilon, that would work. Um, I'm also discussing with the Fedora guys because they are facing the same issue. They are already using Ansible, but just only, just Ansible natively. But on the other side, um, I admit that, well, it's not a secret that we use Jenkins a lot, right, it's for CI. For a previous job, I was also already orchestrating, um, well, using, abusing Jenkins for operation side, launching Ansible Playbook and delegating those tasks or those role uh, to, for example, people from release management. And I revisited that during a comparison of uh, what AWX can do and Jenkins. And it seems to, I don't, it's a crazy idea, but for us, it seems that even just using Jenkins as a kind of crown executor on top of Ansible Playbook makes sense. I can explain you why, in, I have a slide just for that because I give a talk just about that but I don't think that we'll have enough minutes for that. But in two, s two minutes, we have machine everywhere. So latency is, a, is, a, is an issue, especially for Ansible through SSH. So there is now, you've probably heard of a Mitogen thing, which is not in Ansible core, but it's developed by a guy from uh, UK uh, to speed up things. You should have a look. That's really promising. Um, but still, if you have one AWX machine uh, from whatever, for in the US, for example, targeting machine in Australia or in China or Malaysia or Brazil, that takes a lot, a lot of time just to render the playbook. While in Jenkins, what you can do is that you have one master and multiple slaves. Right? So that's the traditional way for CI and building package. Try to apply the same principle for operation. You have one Jenkins master that knows everything about how to call a specific Ansible playbook. And you can divide it by region, for example. You can have one slave per region or even per country, depending. And that is the executor to the, the machine launching the playbook and report back the result to the Jenkins master in one location. Um, Jenkins supports also GUnit, which uh, Ansible does by default. It has a GUnit callback. So you have even good graphs in Jenkins automatically. It's not meant to be used on top of, Gen of uh, Ansible, but it works fine. At the moment, in, in AWX, there is no concept of you have multi node set up, that's true, but more like in HA and using the same PostgreSDB. So no, I don't think that I win in, in Europe accessing a Postgres over a VPN tunnel just to be able to locally launch my playbook. Does that, does that answer the question? Great. Well, we can just discuss later af after implementation details if you want. So other question, yes. The microphone at the back, please. Uh, I actually have two questions. One is the Ansible repo that you guys use, like in all the playbooks, is that open source? Is that public? Uh, not yet, because I told you that initially, I, um, I said that <laughs> officially we were, we were a puppet shop, 
And I think that I probably just forced a little bit to Ansible to enter the, so it was semi-official. Um, but we, as now we decide to officially migrate from Puppet to Ansible, uh, we'll just review everything and publish everything uh, on probably on GitHub on first step, but after that on Pagure when we'll have migrated to Pagure. Okay. So yes, that's a goal. Okay. Uh, my second question is: Can you talk at all? Can you compare about um, if a if a contributor from the community wants to start volunteering on CentOS Infra, uh, can you compare the process for doing that versus the process that we use in Fedora for onboarding new people? That's um, the, the answer can surprise you, but that will be really easy in a sense that the question is about comparison. There is nothing to compare. You have a process, we don't. That's a problem. <laughs> and that's a problem that we have to solve. Really. That's the reason why I wanted to attend your talk, but I, was, I wasn't able to because I was busy with Patrick doing something but uh, sure that's the reason why I would like to collaborate more because we can learn a lot of you and probably you can learn some of the things from us because does it make sense to search on each on our side to solve exactly the same problem so right. we can learn from each other that's why we said collaboration more and more right, right. so um, that's ex that's exactly the point where we want to go with the fact that we want to op to publicly uh, show everything that is used so that people can just do pull requests, for example, against code in the infra without even a, a need to touch the machine or just get inspired or whatever. So that's, that's a process we need to, that's basically how we want to do things. But yeah, that's a process that we really have to write and have some people probably spend time on because that's true that we have nothing. Um, that's, that's probably one of the legacy issue with the CentOS ecosystem that it was still based on the idea that it was just three guys doing that somewhere. And so not communicating a lot because they had no time to communicate a lot or even have time to on-ramp other people. That's one thing that we should solve now. That we try to with the CI system and also on the infra level. Right. Thank you. No more questions? They thank you then. <laughs>